I love this venue. Um, so, I, it's fun. I have a habit of being the last speaker before beer every time. What's up with that? Um, my beer's here, though, so I, I brought a beer on stage. I hope you think that's okay. Um, so, my name is... Uh, can I get my slides up here? Yes. My name is Michael, and uh, I am uh, at Flareup on all the socials. That's my last name. How many in here have had a hard time explaining what they do to people? Yeah, all right. Uh, ever get asked that at a family thing or a party? Like, what do you do? And you're like, um, it's almost impossible to explain, right? I, I get asked that a lot, and that, that's why I made this tiny intro here that, that kind of explains that. <laughs> so, uh, when I was asked to talk today, um, I was like really thrilled because, see, I am a, I'm a designer. I've been working as a visual designer for many years and started a bunch of, of different companies and I've worked on a lot of exciting projects. And if you do that for long enough, you're eventually put on stage to talk about it. So, the past five years, I, I've been traveling the world, I've been speaking to designers and to developers about icon design and entrepreneurship and things like that. There's nothing wrong with any of that stuff. I love that stuff. That's amazing. Big part of my career. However, the real truth is actually that one of my biggest passions is making games. But I'm rarely invited to talk about that because I've been doing the other things for so long. So, you know, <laughs> the kind people of Web Today, they liked my idea of, of doing a talk about augmented reality um, and a game that we've made. So I'm, I'm very excited about that. In 2016, uh, I started a company called Northplay, and uh, Northplay is like an entertainment design studio. What does that mean? Well, it, it means that when someone needs something fun, we can build it. Now, Northplay is also very much a startup, and we knew we wanted to take every moment uh, when we're not building things for clients and spend it on making things we thought was fun. See, when you want to be a video game company, you actually have to release video games, apparently. So we, uh, we knew we wanted to make a game, but which game and how and why, right? So when you're just starting out as a small company, it's pretty daunting to set out on that journey of creating your first commercial game. We ended up doing like a whole franchise, and, and this middle game here is called Conduct AR, and that's, that's what we're going to talk about today. It, I've made this talk called Designing for Augmented Reality, um, and I'll share some stories and some things we learned creating that game. Now, um, as a side note, Conduct Deluxe, actually won an award uh, just a few weeks ago in Copenhagen uh, at the, the Danish Game Awards. We were very surprised and quite drunk. Um, so, so I was thinking a lot about how to start this talk, and I think it would be beneficial to start at the beginning, not with Conduct AR, but with the game that came before it. Not only because I think it's a good story, but because it'll give, us, it'll give you a better idea of why and how we started with augmented reality, and what our process was, and what kind of preconceived ideas we actually had going in there. I had just started the company, poured all my money into it, and we're trying to figure out what game to make, right? And we reached out to one of our favorite local uh, low-poly artists, that's Bass, there in the middle. He, he had some time, he was like, hey, do you want to work with a small game company that has literally no money and no plans to make a game that we don't know anything about? Yeah, that sounds cool. Um, and then we brainstormed all these concepts. And uh, we knew we wanted to make a mobile game. We had some experience on mobile. And for a while there, we played around with this idea of large trucks moving things around. Now, my son was around two at the time. And like most two-year-olds, he was very fascinated with large vehicles. I think most two-year-olds are, actually. I don't know what's up with that, but you know, so we took some inspiration from that, tried to make a fun puzzle game that involved large vehicles. Never actually publicly shown these before, so this kind of fun little thing. Talking about large vehicles, we briefly explored this idea of a, a polar expedition type craft that would move things around. We started drafting these ideas for this game that we called Arctic Commander. Um, maybe you would operate like an entire Arctic base and bass and you made these wonderful renderings, right? You see where the inspiration for this came from? 
very much inspired by Arctic Lego. Because that stuff is rad, right? It's so awesome. And uh, gameplay ideas sort of like puzzle-like. You'd move these large vehicles around, but it wasn't really working out for us. Like The challenges, they weren't immediate, and the theme, even though it was rad, uh, it didn't help us dial in the gameplay. And the vehicles, the vehicles they just weren't large enough, right? Just not big enough. So what's bigger than a big truck? Trains. Trains are much, much bigger. So um, we, we all love trains, including my son. And I have many fond childhood memories of playing uh, Transport Tycoon and, and games like that. Um, and once we started down that track, things clicked into place for us. These trains were traveling on these rails here. And uh, the challenge, that would obviously be to transport passengers on time, I guess. Uh, and con conduct this is like a perfect example of where the theme of the game it helps us propel the game design and the goal of the game, right? So this is actually the first video we have of, of trains moving in Conduct This. And it's, it's going the wrong way around because the switch is that way. It's kind of fun. So Bass, he applied his wonderfully low poly art style. And, and the game design started to take shape. You transport passengers on time. And all you do is, is tap to stop the train and then tap to start the train. It's pretty simple, actually. Um, and challenges would then be revolving around not making the trains crash, right, into each other or into other trains or into vehicles. It's essentially like a, a crazy management game of sorts. So it became very level-based, uh, where each level was very carefully crafted to pose a particular challenge within that certain time frame. And we did lots of these levels on paper, like sketching them out, like these different track layouts, because it was so much cheaper. And when you learn the mechanics, you could do that in your head. Um, and as you progressed through the game, you'd unlock multiple trains that you could play with. And the game was quickly growing in scope, as all games do when you start working on them. Oh, what if you could unlock new trains to play with? <gasps> OK, we have to make new models then. And we were s sort of running out of money. Um, so we had to release the game real fast. And finally, on December 2nd, 2016, we released Conduct This. And this is what the trailer looked like. <laughs> So, awesome. And uh, like every other game developer, we did everything we could to hype our game, right? So this is like the first title and everything depended on it. We had spent eight months building it and like with most young studios, without some form of success, we'd probably be bust, right? We'd be done. Um, and after the first re uh, week of reaching out to everyone we knew, like blogs, newsletters, game journalists, we had 10,000 downloads, which is good, but not really great for a free game. So, but then it happened, what every developer wants, we got featured, right next to Super Mario Run. Uh, and uh, then we got 10,000 downloads per hour, which was absolutely insane. Here's a ridiculous image from Unity Analytics, where new users just pouring in. They have these live views with all these little dots flying up. Now, this talk isn't uniquely about Conduct This, but suffice to say that we, we worked our butts off in 2017 more than to more than triple the amount of content in the game. We won an IMGA award in, in San Francisco, and we crossed the 3 million download mark. We're actually almost at 4 million now. And there are other things I could talk about, for example, how we went about sustaining the interest of that game through stacker-themed updates, making all these different things here, or how we increased our retention with minor tweaks uh, to the introduction levels, and how we learned to love game metrics. But that is for another talk. Now, now, we had a game that was doing great, right? Got critical acclaim. All we had to do was just follow that up, another, make another successful game, right? That's easy, easy. So at Dub Dub, 
WWDC in 2017, Apple announces ARKit. Remember this? Uh, and it got us thinking, you know what? Maybe we could take conduct this and turn it into an AR game, right? No, we couldn't. But you know, I'll get back to that. Um, so, cool. I'll control the audio from here. So we started playing around with taking conduct this and casting it in an augmented reality scene. Here's some of the first footage we released, actually. Now, any of you, any of you played conduct this might re recognize some of these levels, actually. Um, it was it was like a little crude, but the first week we were just sort of thrilled playing around with trains on the desk in the studio. Just wow, look at this thing, right? Um, and what we were learning, though, would become one of the key takeaways from this whole process. Yeah, that's what that looked like in the beginning. C. We couldn't just add augmented reality as a layer to our game. AR is not an afterthought. It's not a fun gimmick that you can just apply to an existing game design. It's not a layer of technological paint. Uh, it is a core interaction method that you need to design specifically for. There's a couple of reasons why this is true, but and most of them, most of them has to do with one big difference between AR and conventional media. And I'll get back to that. But in the case of Conduct This, this results were devastating, right? Uh, see, Conduct This is already a pretty difficult game. I've seen grown men cry all over this on YouTube. So, uh, and what we quickly found out was that by making the game take place in augmented reality, the difficulty just shot way up. People couldn't complete the levels at all. The fact is that every level in Conduct This is finely engineered, it's a finely engineered experience. Each level on the map is made to extract a certain challenge from the player in a fixed amount of time. It's what the entire game is built on. So why was AR suddenly making the game a lot harder? Because instead of seeing this, this is a controlled environment in a fixed frame that basically requires you to have the focus and overview to control what's going on. People in Conduct AR was doing this. They're suddenly in control of the viewfinder into the world and swinging the device around to focus on various points of interest. So by letting our game take place in reality, we also relinquished control of the camera to the user. Does this make sense? Yeah, that's a few nods, yeah. So they were now in charge of where to look and when. Is that fun? Well, we'll get back to that. But you know, one thing was clear, Conduct This was absolutely not built to handle that ab additional layer of abstraction. So when we started out, I think I personally thought that the biggest differentiator for AR was that it took place in the real world, right? That's what you're seeing in all the demos. That's what, what a lot of, that's what wows a lot of people when you see augmented reality demos, like, whoa, it's, it's taking place right here. I could have done a live demo to show you. Look, it's happening right here on, on the stage, right? Um, but that's not at all the single most important thing about uh, the, the difference between AR and conventional entertainment design. Like, m m the biggest challenge when designing for AR is the inability of the designers to control the camera. So much of regular entertainment actually relies on us you know, the creators being able to show players where and when to look. Now, this type of orchestrated storytelling is almost impossible when the player just you know, has the freedom to control the viewfinder of the world. And it has massive ramifications for how we communicate in-game events and interfaces, and most of, mo most of the other stuff I'm going to talk about in this talk is a direct result from, from this change here. And it meant that there was no chance for us to convert conduct this and all the content we had made for that game to AR. So if we were to make a conduct AR game, we would have to throw out every level that we had just spent a year building, basically, and start from scratch. The only thing we'd be able to keep would be the core mechanics and the goal of the game. So that's what we did. Now, we had already come too far to turn back. We had told people, we had released the, like, uh, this video on YouTube, and we had told Apple, hey, Apple, we're doing this cool AR game. Uh, and they were like, sure, cool, we'll feature you if you're ready for iOS 11. We were like, yeah, definitely, we're doing this. Um, so we were basically, we, we painted ourselves in a corner. We, 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 at this point, we were like only two months left, and we had to produce a good AR experience. Um, and, and Conduct AR would be a totally standalone title built from scratch around what makes augmented reality really shine. So what, what exactly does make AR shine, though? We were about to find out. 
One thing that we found out was really enjoyable was actually the thing that made AR so hard on our existing game design, the freedom of the player to look everywhere they wanted. It, it occurred to us that we could flip that to our advantage. If we could design levels that didn't always require the player to have the complete overview of the track, like instead create a spatial awareness um, and a curiosity of the player. Puzzles where the player had to look over mountains or you know, peek inside valleys, see trains rushing through canyons and, and catch them on the other side. A game where the player had to physically move around to play the game. We were not surprisingly learning that AR works best when you try not to design against the constraints of freedom. You can't control the camera, but you can create an experience that somehow revolves around spatial awareness and nudging the player towards a specific way of interacting with the world. Now, in our case, that meant that the, the challenges we were throwing at the player had to sort of urge them to move the camera in a certain way, right? How do we do that? How do we make sure that people actually have to get around, not just sit with in early tests, people just sat down and played it on the couch, like, no, move, get up, do something, right? Um, and in our case, we, to force the player to actually move the viewfinder and move themselves, we started designing levels that had a much higher degree of vertical obstacles. So we introduced mountains that you had to physically move around if you wanted to follow your trains and maintain control. We introduced uh, canyons and tunnels that snaked around, forcing you to get up from your position and look down inside the network. And once we started to experiment with these types of challenges and embracing what makes AR special, the game it changed drastically. Here's an odd picture of me surrounded by one of those mountain levels. It's kind of a fun photo because my employee Christian screenshotted this on his iPhone while he's, t he's playing the game and we're having a meeting about you know, that level. So it's kind of in it's AR inception. Um, so we also learned that losing your place and your focus was much, much easier in Conduct AR than it was in Conduct This. And this is obviously another direct result of losing control of the camera, right? Controlling the camera was actually a pretty big mental drain on players. And so doing that and playing the game at the same time turned out to be really difficult. So we cut back on the amount of trains in the, uh, in the levels. We focused on micromanaging like a few vehicles. and. Um, through interesting terrain. And this particular challenge is probably what makes action puzzles general, generally ill-suited for AR. Games like Conduct AR has a lot of stuff going on. So trains moving around, little world, and, and balancing the difficulty and juggling the goals of the game with the task of controlling the camera and you know the actual game was like at the center of the design challenge. Also, we were running out of time because this guy was like, where is it? Right? Um, Apple was asking for updates on the game's progress, and we had less than a month left before the big launch of iOS 11. We didn't have, if we didn't have something ready for launch, we would have missed a massive opportunity. Um, and so armed with these new understandings of AR and this renewed focus on balancing uh, interesting spatial puzzles with an awareness of how difficult it actually is for players to control the game and the camera, we're finally producing interesting gameplay. However, something was still missing. We needed like a theme to tie it all together, right? Something that, that felt like a good fit with the levels that we were producing. Like we had, you have to imagine this, we had like these little worlds with mountains and canyons and trains on rickety suspensions in vertical puzzles. And what then it dawned on us, we weren't actually making this game. This was actually the icon for a long time. This is, the, this is literally the conduct this icon with some ARified laser stuff shooting out of it. We weren't making that game, the ARified version of Conduct This. We were making this game, like an epic, like Old West epic adventure with steam engines rushing through old gold mines and, and Wild West outposts. And, and once we uncovered that, that, that last piece of the puzzle, a lot of things just clicked for us. So see, we had the, in, in Conduct This, we had this low poly art style, and it worked great for that game, but it actually never really looked awesome in, in, uh, in Conduct AR. In a highly stylized world like this one with a fixed camera, like the minimalistic approach is it's fine, but with the freedom to explore everything in augmented reality, the minimalism kind of like became like a, a wasteland, really. That didn't really feel all that interesting to explore. So like we did with, the, with our level design, we threw out most of our assets which our 3D designer was very happy about, <laughs> and started from scratch. Like, you have one month 
make everything in the game again. So with only a few weeks left before the deadline, I, we revamped almost every single asset of the game. Our 3D artist, Christian, he kicked some serious ass. We put on every Wild West track we could find in the studio, and we just, you know, on Spotify, we just started building all these building blocks that we would need to create that Old West world, right? And uh, we reworked every single new level made up until that point, dressing each of them. And uh, I think if you look at this and you look at the other picture before, the graphical fidelity of the game jumped a few notches and the tiny worlds we were building became more interesting to explore. And uh, the theme also helped us frame the level progression of the game. You travel through these five different lands in hot pursuit of a mysterious horse carriage that's always like one step ahead of you. With these new, more detailed worlds, we're suddenly seeing testers much more eagerly moving the device around, zooming in to get like a closer look. And we left a lot of little fun, little stories and details for the, for the curious players to find when they looked hard enough, like the mystery of the stolen mine carts or, or the drunken cowboy that fell off one of the levels, right? And all these little assets are sprinkled out throughout the game that didn't have any actual impact on the game, but it just made the world more rich to explore. It was fun. And um, essentially what we learned was if you want your players to show interest in your augmented reality world, you should probably create a world worth exploring, right? So we're about to run out of time when another roadblock appears, or rather, you know, it's, it's always been there. But like most game designers, most designers, we just ignored the elephant in the room for the longest possible time. Like it took, it, it took this email from Apple for us to finally realize it. It says, I am struggling with controls in the AR mode as I need two hands to hold an iPad and it makes it really difficult to hold the device and tap on railroad switches or trains. Have you looked into indirect controls? This is two weeks before we're supposed to be done, right? And something is wrong with our controls. There was a, a mild panic at the office, um, but it's been here right in front of us all the time. Here's actually a video of me struggling with that exact thing in our earlier tests, holding the device, particularly if it's a bigger device like an iPad, while controlling the camera and interacting with the trains and the switches. It's just really hard. Notice how you know, I have to adjust my grip to, to, to do this, and this isn't usually a problem with, with action puzzle games because, you know, the, the scene doesn't move if you have unsteady hands, but in AR, every little piece of motion can lead to explosions, right? So here was this big design problem. We had less than two weeks left before we had to launch. How do we solve this, right? Do you guys know? There's a few of you know, a few of you know. We introduced a center cursor. So this is actually like one of those things where the most simple solution is the elegant solution. Basically, you'd be able to point your device at any object you, you could interact with, and it would light up, and then two buttons would appear on the side, right next to your thumbs. We actually even color-coded the things so that the different actions had a different outline on the object, so you can see what would happen when you, when you tap them. And having that center cursor and those thumb buttons, that it added like another layer of control to the game that made it a lot more accessible. Like some people would still tap the screen, you still could, but generally this new way of interacting with, with the objects in the world, uh, it, it helped lower the difficulty of the game a lot. You see the different, uh, the different outlines up there, different color outlines. That's actually a really good solution. So what we're essentially learning was that we should be absolutely sure that players weren't being punished for controlling the camera. Interacting with the game shouldn't come at the expense of camera movement and vice versa. You guys still awake, right? You're out there, you're very quiet. Okay. Another thing we learned was that you, you always want to allow players to reposition the game in the real world. AR can be like, a, it's still a, lit, a bit flaky. The technology is, I know that Apple just introduced AR Kit 2, uh, we have a, AR Core from Google, but let's face it, this is the, this is the infancy of the, te of the technology, right? And uh, you can quite quickly uh, lose the orientation, and you don't want the player to be unable to correct it. We added like a little button that, al that allows you to sort of pick up, pick up, 
the actual thing and then place it again. Um, because you, sometimes you might accidentally put it in a corner or something like that. Also, another important lesson that makes the whole experience a little more human is that you can scale the game after the player's circumstances to have like that real sense of scale. So in Conduct AR, uh, the, the game gets real small if you place it over there by the couch. And it gets real big when you place it next to you, right? So you kind of have like this sense of scale. And in that way, you can also kind of decide how big or how small you want the game to take place. There's like some physicality to it. Also, AR is still fairly new. And you know what? Most players, they don't know how to interact with your game or your product. And, uh, and there's always some requirements that aren't, really, that aren't really there in other media. Like, I don't know if you guys know this, but you actually need like, a good textured surface with proper lighting to, to use AR. You can't just do it in a dark room or on a complete like, white table, for example. So it's, it's like a pretty good idea to, to, to give clear instructions when you start. We made this thing for Conduct AR. And it, it, you, you're kind of like an ambassador of AR when you make AR products these days. You're going to expect a lot of people who've never tried this technology before. So you have to be really clear on onboarding the users, even more clear than you would regularly be in, in other areas of tech that are sort of more out there. This is an interesting one. Uh, another thing we learned that really applied to our work as interface designers, designing interfaces in AR requires you to think really carefully about what is in world and what is you know out of the world, and how you make that like how you make vital information available to the player without the ability to hijack the camera. So some UI can exist in in a 3D world, but what about information, for example, that's really vital for the player, like uh, you know, you're about to die or something? Like right? you can't. Like, what if the player looks away from that? So we actually, I think we had a pretty neat trick in Conduct Air where the level information would appear in in, in uh, in, in world as a 3D object and then fix itself to the viewfinder. Notice how it goes up there? It's actually hovering above the level for a moment there, crossroads. <laughs> Boop, and then it's stuck. Now it's actually stuck to the viewfinder. So we kind of have this symbiosis of something that exists in, in the 3D world but then sticks to the viewfinder. I, th I thought that was kind of a, a cool solution. But this guy, back to this guy, right? Michael, where is the game? So time was up. iOS 11 launched on September 19th, 2017, about a year ago, um, and it was now or never. So we uh, we released Conduct AR, and this is what our launch trailer looked like. So we're, I mean, it was a close call there for a moment, but uh, we actually released that and got featured by Apple. And since the, the game's actually been paraded around as a, as a good example of, of how to do AR game design, and that's why I'm allowed to go up on stage and talk about it. And it's also the first game that I ever designed a roll-up for, <laughs> which is kind of cool. Notice, though, the conductor hats, right? That's you gotta. So uh, we would eventually update the game with a difficulty setting because Conduct AR, like its its older sibling, Conduct This, is still a very very difficult game. I actually, you know, this is a challenge for me to you. I have not seen anyone complete the game. So, you know, I know I have done it myself. I know it's it's possible. It's pretty it's pretty damn difficult. Um, and not on on the, the the little train, right? On the big train. So you can try that. In around three months, we challenged ourselves to create an augmented reality version of our popular game, Conduct This. 
it wasn't what we thought it would be. I hope that this talk sort of gave you an idea of that. In the process, we had to throw out most of what we knew about our own game and our own content and our own assets and create this new experience around this new edge of technology. And um, we learned a lot, but above all, we learned that AR is not an afterthought. You need to, you need to design specifically for the constraints and the strengths of augmented reality. If you're going, or else you're going to end up with something that's very shallow and very gimmicky. And I, I think you've all probably seen some AR products that might you know, fit that description. And maybe the biggest challenge there is is that you need to design experiences around the fact that the user has the freedom to control the camera. Now, this pushes you to think about spatial awareness and, and space in general a lot more than in other forms of media. As a designer, it, that's actually a really tough thing to go into. If you, all your tools are geared towards one thing, you're used to thinking in, 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 this, in 2D or at least uh, in 3D, but able to control where the player looks and then suddenly lose that, that that whole way of working, like it was mind-bending for me at least. Um, and it, it will change everything about your product. And it, it's very easy. I think it's very easy to make a mediocre augmented reality experience in 2018. That's the it's one of the easiest things to do. Um, but if you do it right, you're in for a wild ride. Thank you. <laughs>